What's up awesome humans and welcome to my channel. I'm Sarah Matthews and in this video we're going to be processing the Triangulum Galaxy M33 uh, using PixInsight. Uh, if you don't have data of the M33 galaxy that's totally fine. You can use data from uh, any galaxy that you have data from. Um, this workflow should work just fine for that. This workflow is focusing on the data while it's still in a linear state so the data has not been stretched. However if you want to check out my video uh, where we do process the data in a non-linear state or after the data has been stretched. I have part two of this video series down in the uh, description box below if you want to go check it out. All right, I have PixInsight open, obviously, and the version I'm running is 1.8.9-1. I have my data of the Triangulum Galaxy M33 right here. These are my four master light files. The data is still in a linear state, that's why we can't see anything, but we can apply a non-destructive auto stretch to the data so we can see what we're working with before we apply a permanent stretch to the data. We can do that a few different ways on a keyboard. If you have a Mac, it's gonna be Command A. If you're on a PC, it's gonna be Control A. You can also come over here to this drop down menu and select this little radiation button dude. And you can also open up a screen transfer function process and select this radiation button as well and that will do the trick. So this is my red master light file of the Triangulum Galaxy. Here is the green master light file. Here is the blue master light file. And here's the HA master light file. Now all of these images were taken using my ASI 2600 MM Pro with my red, green, blue, and HA astronomical filters. If you do not have HA data, no worries at all. Uh, just skip over that part of the workflow. If you have a luminance master light file already, that will work just fine for this workflow. I however do not have a master luminance image as you can tell but i am going to be creating a synthetic luminance image later on in the workflow so just wanted to give you a heads up about that now let's move into the first item on the docket and that is of course making sure that all of our images are aligned or sometimes referred to as image registration now I've already gone ahead and done image registration uh, during the pre-processing steps of my workflow. However, if you have not, I highly recommend doing this or else your channel combination is just not going to work. <laughs> so come up here to process all processes and down here to start alignment. And the process is going to look like this. So you're going to want to select a reference image for all the other images to be aligned to. I would recommend using the image with the highest signal to noise ratio. Uh, you can find out what that is by using the subframe selector process. So I would just type in red or I would select it from this little drop down menu here. And then I would also select inherit astrometric solution data and then I would add in the rest of the views. So all the images that need to be um, aligned to red would be green, blue, and HA. Press OK keep everything else the same, and then press apply global, and then you should get three new images. You're going to get one new green master light file, one new blue master light file, and one new HA master light file, or whatever images that you needed to be registered to the reference image. Uh, those images will then have been registered to red, and then you can close out of your existing uh, green, blue, and HA images, or whatever images that were not already registered because you're not going to need those anymore. To continue on in the spirit of image geometry, we want to make sure that we have cropped away any weird edges like the edges you see here on HA or black edges like we have here on the blue master light file. These are stacking artifacts that occurred during the image integration process due to field rotation. So to do this, we are going to come up here to process, come down here to geometry and open up dynamic crop. 
So since we do have multiple images, it's important that all of the images have the same crop dimensions. So we're going to pick one image to start with. I'm going to be picking the blue image since it has the most obvious uh, artifacts of field rotation, but I need to go through all the other images and kind of just take inventory of the edges that they have so that when I do crop blue, I'm taking those other images as edges into account. So let's start here and just make this blue image active or whichever image has either the most detail or the most uh, issues, I guess. Click reset and now that image is active. And so let's just go through HA and see its edges. Go over to green. Green kind of has a little bit. And then for red, just a few, little bit up here. All right, cool, that's in my brain now. Um, so we can come back to blue or whichever image that you're using to apply the crop to first. And let's start bringing in those edges, keeping in mind, again, all of the edges that we saw that need to be removed from the other images. This is when it comes in handy to have a photographic memory if you have one. Uh, I do not, so if this takes a little bit of trial and error, that's okay too. So I think that will be pretty good. So before we apply this crop to the blue image, I'm going to create that process icon that I talked about earlier. So come over here to new instance, uh, left click on your mouse and click and drag down. Now we can apply this crop to the blue master light file, press execute. And if all went swimmingly and you're happy with the crop, you can minimize whatever image you started with. You can close out of dynamic crop and then you can apply that same exact crop that we did on blue and created in this process icon and apply it to all of your other images. So I'm going to apply it to red now. That looks good. I'll apply it to green. That looks good. And I'm going to apply it to HA. That looks good. Next, we're going to get into some really fun stuff and we're going to improve the quality of our images by using the dynamic background extraction process, also sometimes referred to as DBE for short. Um, I think I can speak for most of us astrophotographers out there that we would all love for the photons in our images to only be from the depths of space. Uh, that would be super rad, but uh, sadly that is... Um, rarely the case, and more times than not, our images suffer from things like uh, light pollution from nearby cities and from the moon and from other forms of gradients and unwanted signal, as well as flat field errors. My images definitely do. Uh, but fortunately for us, we can use the dynamic background extraction process to correct for these issues. So let's go and open it up up here to process, down here to background modelization, and over to dynamic background extraction. And here it is in all of its glory. So before we get started, we could theoretically combine our red, green, and blue images to create a color RGB image and then run dynamic background extraction on that color image. But I'm going to be using dynamic background extraction on all of my images before I color combine, just because I have some complex gradients that I want to uh, try to address before I color combine. But you can see what works best for your data. So since I have several images that I'm going to be running dynamic background extraction on, I'm going to be starting off with the image with the um, highest signal to noise ratio, and then I'm going to be creating a process icon from that DBE set of parameters and apply that to the um, other uh, images that I have. So I'm going to start on red, and then I'm going to create a, a DBE process icon that will be then applied to the green, blue, and HA images. So in order to use dynamic background extraction, what we're essentially going to be doing is trying to compensate for variations in flat field errors or light pollution um, or other forms of gradients by modeling the background or the sky of our image by placing sample points on the background here to help create a more proper or natural state of the sky. And so these sample points are basically measurements that are going to allow DBE to create a model of the image's background 
um, or sky, which can then be used to compensate for the issues I mentioned earlier and improve the quality of the image. And so there are two ways to approach samples, if you didn't already know this. Uh, the first uh, way is either manually placing them onto the image ourselves or by generating them automatically onto the image. For the case of this image and other images of galaxies where there's a central object like a galaxy like said M33 here and a lot of surrounding dark sky, we are going to be automatically generating samples onto the image. If your galaxy, however, has IFN, which stands for Integrated Flux Nebula, all around the galaxy and throughout the image, then you would want to probably place samples manually. But that is for another video, and we're just going to focus on um, automatically sampling or automatically generating our samples. We do need to make our image active, so I'm going to click on the image and you're going to see these crosshairs on the image now. So the image is active and now we can use the process. I'm going to come over here to sample generation and I'm going to keep the default sample radius uh, at 18. This basically just means how large the sample size is going to be. And then for samples per row, I'm going to keep it at the default of 10. So it's just going to uh, generate 10 samples per row, so exactly what it sounds like. And for the minimum sample weight, I want the sample weight to be high enough, so I'm going to keep it at 0.75. And then I'm going to press generate, and let's see how that does. Now it looks like there were a few samples generated, um, which is not a bad thing, but the bad part of the results is that it doesn't appear that any of the samples were placed on the lighter or the darkest parts of our image, so we need to adjust some parameters for that. And so here under model parameters, we can control the range of pixel brightness that can accept a sample. So for tolerance, the tolerance basically refers to how bright the pixels can be. And for shadows relaxation, that means how dark the pixels can be. So I'm going to become more tolerant of the um, brightness pixel values, so I'm going to increase it to 3. And because of that, I want to reduce the shadows relaxation to about 1.5. I'm going to keep the smoothing factor at the default, and let's press generate and see how that does. Alright, so that looks pretty good. We have a better distribution of samples across the darker and lighter parts of our image. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each sample point and I'm going to make sure that they aren't on any bright stars and if they are then I'm going to move them off and if I have any samples um, over my galaxy I'm going to delete them. So I'm going to start with this uh, sample point here and it, you can tell it's active because it's green and so in this window over here, here are all the pixels in that sample and so I'm going to move through each sample by clicking on this button here. And Alright, so in order for us to move this sample off of this brighter star, I'm just going to click on it and drag it down. And I'm just going to go back and I'm going to keep moving through. That's okay. And so DBE probably takes me the longest of all the processes to go through and I mean I recommend taking your time on DBE it's just something that you need to experiment with and do some trial and error I'm not gonna go into every single detail about DBE because truly that could be probably its own series of videos but my hope is that by trial and error and through just understanding the basics of dynamic background extraction you can experiment with your data and see which parameters work best for your uh, images because each image is going to be different, each data set is going to be different, and you just want to make sure that you dial in the best settings possible for your data. And so again, take some time, become comfortable with DBE, and don't be afraid of it if you are, at least I was. So I'm going to finish going through these samples and I will be right back. Alright, I am finished moving off any of the samples that were on Bright Stars, and I have also went ahead and deleted all of the samples that were placed on the Galaxy. Now we need to decide what type of correction we're going to be using. I'm going to generally be using the division process, so come over here to target image correction. So you can not do anything at all, but I'm going to be using division, and the main reason I'm doing division is because in all of my images I have some unequal field illumination, and I just want to correct for that, so if you do have uh, flat filled errors like that, um, try out division, it's a really great place to start. 
And if you don't have those types of issues, maybe just start with subtraction. You can also do division, and if you still have some um, remaining gradients, go ahead and use subtraction as well. So let's try out division. I'm going to keep everything here the same because I want to see the background model and press execute. All right, let's take a peek at the background gradient. All right, that looks pretty good. You want to see if this matches what you're looking at from the gradient in the actual image itself. Now let's take a peek at this. And this looks pretty good. I'm happy with this. So what I'm going to do, I am going to apply these settings not only to red, but also to all of the other images. And if you have a master luminance file, you're going to also want to apply these settings, these exact same settings to your master luminance file. The reason why you want to do that is you want all the same matching values so that when you do combine all the images later on, it's just much more seamless and it looks much better. So I'm going to create that process icon here by clicking on this new instance, dragging it down, and there we go. So I'm now going to apply DBE to the actual red image so it's saved in its history. So I will select replace target image and I'm going to discard the background model and then press execute. All right, let's take a peek, command A or control A if you're on a PC and we are good to go. I'm going to close out of DBE and I'm going to apply these to all of my other images. So I've gone ahead and applied that DBE division process to all of my remaining images. So all of my images have the same dynamic background extraction process applied to them. Now we are ready to move into color combination and create our RGB color image. So let's go ahead and open up channel combination, come up here to process, all processes, and down to channel combination. I always miss it. Okay. Here it is. Uh, we want the color space to remain at the default of RGB for channels slash um, source images. We want to apply the master light files for each channel. So for the R channel, that's the red channel. We want our red master light file. So I've selected red and then G for the green channel. We want our green master light file for B or the blue channel. We want our blue master light file and then we can press apply global and it will create our RGB color image. Okay, let's minimize channel combination. We can minimize our other images really quick. Give this a quick auto stretch. And as you can see, there is an orange cast. That's because one of the images is dominating the other the other images as far as brightness values. I have not applied linear fit to the RGB data. That's because I tend to only use linear fit on narrowband data, but that's for a whole other discussion. Um, so I'm going to open up the screen transfer function process. If you don't have it open already, go up here to process all processes and screen transfer function. And so right now we are seeing the RGB channels linked, but I'm going to unlink them to correct for the uh, orange color cast. So make sure that we are tracking our changes by clicking on this button here and then come over here to this uh, little link icon and click on that to deselect the channel um, linking and then come over here and press reset and then apply a, another auto stretch and voila. So we can minimize that and we can change the name of image 57 to RGB or really anything that we'd like. Just click over here and then right click, select identifier. I'm going to use RGB, but you can use whatever you would like, whatever your heart tells you to do and press OK. And there we are. Now that we have our RGB image, we are going to go ahead and apply some color calibration to it. Color calibrating the image is going to essentially set the Y balance correctly of the image and it's going to correct the colors of the stars and the galaxy overall to match actual astronomical data of this region of space, which is why we are, need to embed some plate solving data into this. So to do that, we are going to come here to script 
image analysis and click on image solver. So here is the image plate solver script. Under target image, you want to make sure that active window is selected. Then under image parameters, come down here to image scale. Make sure that the focal distance of your telescope or your camera lens is here. And if you don't know what the focal distance is offhand, you can just Google your model and put that here. And then you want to make sure that you have the correct pixel size of your camera sensor here. And again, you can just Google the uh, camera sensor that you have and it should give you the pixel size here. Next, we are going to select search and I'm going to type in M33. Uh, if you're not uh, processing M33, make sure that you put in whatever uh, galaxy it is that you did image. Press search and Triangulum Galaxy popped up. I'm gonna press OK, and I will leave everything else here the same, and then I'm just gonna press OK. All right, so plate solving data has now been embedded into our RGB image. So we are good to go for color calibration. So let's go ahead and open up the color calibration uh, process that we're gonna be using. So come up here to process down here to color calibration, and we're gonna be using the Spectro Photometric Color Calibration Process. Really surprised I did not butcher that name. So under calibration, I'm gonna keep the white reference at average spiral galaxy for the QE curve, which is the quantum efficiency curve of your uh, camera sensor. You can keep it at the default if you don't know uh, what model your camera sensor is, but like I said, you can just go ahead and Google it. I do know that my camera has the Sony IMX571 sensor. And then for the red filter, make sure you select the filter that you used when you were imaging through your red filter. So for me, it was ZWR. And then for green, it was ZWOG. And the blue filter was ZWOB. Keep everything else here the same. Um, for uh, the catalog search, I'm going to make sure that the catalog is set to Gaia DR3 SP. Now we need to go ahead and get those um, files that are um, related to the Gaia DR3 SP. So if you haven't done this already, you want to make sure that you do it. So you're going to want to open up your internet browser and go to the PixInsight software distribution system site. You are going to have to log in to your account. Then scroll down here to Gaia DR3 SP small set. Uh, then make sure you download all of these files. Then once they are downloaded, make sure you A, do not put them in the um, actual PixInsight application folders themselves because every time you update your PixInsight um, application, they will be removed. So make sure you put them somewhere else on your computer um, and also make sure you place them in a place where you'll actually remember. So go ahead and do that if you haven't already. I'm going to come up here to process all processes and come here to Gaia and under search parameters I want to change the data release from Gaia DR3 to Gaia DR3 forward slash SP and then I'm going to go over here to this uh, little icon button here for preferences and as you can see I already have the um, corresponding files uh, linked but since you may not I'm just going to remove them so I can show you how to do this. Press select. And here are all of the downloaded files. I'm just gonna select all of those, select open, and then press okay. And then I'm going to press apply global. I can minimize that for now. And then I'm going to go ahead and go back to the background neutralization portion of the SPCC or Spectrophotometric Color Calibration Tool. I'm going to select Region of Interest. I'm going to select a, a portion of the night sky that is a good representation of the sky. So let's create a preview, come up here, click on this button here, and I'm going to use this space. So I'm going to come back over to Region of Interest and then from Preview, I'm going to select RGB Preview 01 press OK, and press Apply.
the image is done being calibrated, so we get these two graphs and the white balance functions. Um, it's a good thing when you don't have very many outliers on your lines of best fit. If you want more information on the spectrophotometric color calibration tool, uh, go ahead and check out Adam Block's channel, uh, YouTube channel, and he has some uh, really great videos on this process. So I'm going to close out of the graphs. I'm going to minimize SPCC for now. And Gaia. And then I'm going to apply a new auto stretch to this. And that looks good. So you can delete the preview. I'm going to relink the color channels now that we have done some color calibration. So open this up, make sure that it is tracking changes, and select the links. Go ahead and reset. Press the auto stretch. And there we go. Now that we have color calibrated our RGB image, we are going to create our synthetic luminance image. Now if you already have a luminance master light file, then you don't need to create this synthetic luminance image. Um, however, I would still recommend opening up this next process that we're going to open up because you're going to need it later regardless. So let's come up here to process all processes over and down to ooh, RGB working space. And before we extract our synthetic luminance image from here, we need to make sure that the luminance coefficients in this image are all set to one. And that way we have equal parts from all our channels. So now let's go ahead and apply that to RGB. All right, we can minimize that. And now to extract the luminance part of this RGB image, we need to come up here and just select this button here. And let's give it a auto stretch. Uh, we are going to be focusing on some linear noise reduction for both the RGB and luminance image. However, we are going to add some sharpening or we're going to do some sharpening on the luminance image uh, later on. We are also going to be applying some noise reduction to HA as well. So I'm going to be working on the luminance data first. So go ahead and minimize RGB and bring luminance over and open it up a little bit more. Now, moving into linear noise reduction, we're taking a chapter out of John Reese's approach to noise reduction here. And for those who don't know who John Reese is, he's a wonderful astrophotographer who provides excellent online resources for uh, other astrophotographers. I will provide a link to the article that I am referencing here so you can check it out if you would like some more information on it. So for this approach on noise reduction, we're going to be focusing on noise reduction at different frequencies, the high, medium, and low frequency noise in our luminance RGB and HA images. And like I said earlier, we are focusing on the luminance data first, and we are going to be focusing on reducing the high frequency noise first, and then the medium to low frequency noise after that. So high frequency noise exists in our images on what's called a per pixel basis. And this type of noise is from read noise, dark current, and sky fog. Uh, so we're going to be using the TGV denoise process for this. So let's go ahead and open that up now. Come up here to process down here to noise reduction and then over and down to TGV denoise. And the process is gonna look like this. We're going to be working in the CIE LAB mode for this, which allows us to focus on the lightness noise correction of our image. But before we use this tool, we're going to need to create some masks to preserve the fine detail and the fine grain nature of high frequency noise. We want to make sure that we are preserving detail and grain to avoid making our images look plasticky or smudgy because that just doesn't look good. So um, we are going to create two masks for that. And then we are also going to create another mask, but that's going to be for the medium and low frequency noise reduction in the step after this. So let's go ahead and minimize this. And we're going to need two processes for this. So we're going to open up both of these ahead of time. So let's come up here to process all processes and open up curves transformation. And let's minimize that really quick. We'll come back to it. And then the next process we want is the histogram transformation process. So processes, all processes. 
and histogram transformation. Let's minimize that. So the first type of mask that we need for high frequency noise is called a local support mask. And we're gonna create that by duplicating our loom image. So just come over here to the luminance image and left click on your mouse and drag. All right, so this is our luminance clone. Let's rename this to loom mask. okay and we want to make sure that we apply a permanent stretch to this image so come up here to script down here to utilities and then over to delinear and now this image has been permanently stretched now we're going to duplicate this loom mask image and this is going to be the TGV mask that the uh, original loom mask will have so let's come over here and change the identifier I'm gonna name it loom underscore tgv i'm going to minimize the loom mask for now just so it's out of the way so for this mask we want to give it a low contrast look to it where we have higher protection in brighter areas and less protection in the darker areas we of course still want to make sure that the darker areas are protected heavily though so this concept is going to allow us to preserve the fine grain detail uh, but still apply a good amount of noise reduction so to modify this mask, we're gonna apply two different processes to this. So the first is going to be Curves Transformation. So open up Curves Transformation. And we're gonna to want to first adjust the black point output level to somewhere between 0 0.15 and 0 0.25. I'm gonna use 0 0.2 for this. So for your black point output, it's going to be listed as number one out of two. So just type in 0 0.2. You can open up the preview window as well to see what we're doing in real time uh, before we apply. And then come over here, click on that one to reset. And then now we're going to go to the white point output, click on this next point button here. And we want that to be somewhere between 0.5 and 0.65. I'm gonna use 0.5 to start. Click over here again to reset. So basically what we've done here with this lower contrast gray image is we have brightened up the darker parts and we have darkened the lighter parts. So let's apply this by clicking the apply button. You can minimize curves transformation. You can close out of the preview. And now what we need to do is we need to reduce the contrast um, by bringing down the midpoint to 50%. So open up histogram transformation. Make sure we're tracking our changes by clicking on this button here. Make sure Loom TGV is selected, preview, and we're gonna bring this midpoint, the peak of this histogram point, to the 50% range. So bring this arrow over until that peak is at 50%. And so what this is doing, it's brightening up the average level of the mask and improving the protection of everything, especially in the darkest tones. So that looks good, I'm gonna apply that. Okay, and then I'm going to minimize that. I am going to clone this image for another mask, so let's duplicate that. I'm going to rename it to Loom MMT, and we will come back to this mask when we're working on our um, medium and low frequency noise. So back to the Loom TGV noise, we want to make sure that it is inverted, so do Command I or um, Control i if you are on a PC. And let's go ahead and apply this mask to this luminance image. All right, bring this over here. So we should have this red overcast, which means that the image has been applied as a mask. If you wanna see what's going on in the image, even with the mask on, come up here to mask, show mask, and there we go. Let's go ahead and open up TGV Denoise, again working in the CIE LAB mode under lightness, and come down here to the local support panel, make sure you expand that, enable it by clicking on it with the check mark, and we're going to add the support image, and this is going to be that loom mask, the permanently stretched luminance image that we created. Come down here, and it's going to be loom mask, press OK, bring this over here a little bit more. So I like to create some previews. I'm going to create previews in a few different areas. 
Let's do it over in here. And then over here. All right. So, so for our settings, I'm just going to show you what uh, the default settings look like. So go to your first preview and apply those settings to that preview. And that's way too much. Uh, obviously, so let's just adjust some of these parameters. I'm going to keep the strength as is, and then for edge protection, I'm going to keep it at 2.0, and then I'm going to move it down to negative, let's try negative 5. I'll keep the smoothest, smooth, <laughs> smoothness at its default and keep everything else at the default. Open up preview number 2, apply that. And that's way too much still, so I'm going to create another preview again in that same area as well as that older area where the first preview was. Oh. Okay, so let's go over to number four, and I'm going to bring that edge protection to negative six. Actually, I'm going to try negative seven. Actually, I do know negative seven works really well, so let's bring that over. And this is a very, very subtle approach to uh, noise reduction, and you want it to be subtle. Just because something is subtle does not mean that it's not working. Um, this is a really, really great start. There isn't any uh, of that plasticky, smudgy look, um, because when you do that, when you have too much um, noise reduction, it just looks unnatural. So again, that fine grain that we're trying to keep really does bring a bit of depth to the image, and so you want to make sure that you're keeping that. So I'm good with these settings. Um, I'm going to change the iterations to 500, however. So once you have found the settings that you do like, um, change the iterations to 500 and apply it to the luminance image. Okay, and then we can remove the TGV mask from the luminance image. So come up here to mask, remove mask. Now go ahead and open up the Loom MMT mask that we created. Go ahead and open up Histogram Transformation. Now for this mask, we want to make sure that we are bringing the midpoint to the 75% range. This is going to add added protection. So click reset, track our changes, preview, and bring this midpoint to the 75% range up here. So slide it over. And that looks good. Okay, minimize that. Close the preview. And again, we do want to have this inverted, so Command I on a Mac, Control I on a PC. So before we get into addressing the medium and low frequency noise reduction in our luminance image, I first want to go over wavelets with you really quickly, just to help you get an idea for where noise and structures exist within images. So I'm going to come up here to Script down here to image analysis and over to extract wavelet layers and the script looks like this i'm going to make the target image luminance and the number of layers i will keep it at five and have the extracted residual layer um, selected you can keep the scaling function uh, at its default as well press ok so let me minimize residual really quick layer 4, layer 3, layer 2. Okay, so on layer 1, what we're seeing, let me give it a quick auto stretch. So on layer 1 here, this is where a lot of that medium to low frequency noise exists, and this is where we're going to be using our next process, multi-scale median transform, to address this type of noise. Um, we want to be very, very delicate with this type of noise. And so what you'll notice that in layer 2, you still have that medium and low noise here as well, but as you go up in the wavelets, there's less and less noise and larger structures instead. So that's why we're going to be applying more noise reduction on the lower levels because that's where a lot of the noise that we're talking about exists. So I hope that made sense. I'm going to close out of all those layers that I just generated. Thanks for letting me go down that rabbit hole with you guys. I just think it's important to understand what wavelets are and the different frequencies that I'm talking about here. So again, let's open up the luminance MMT image, apply that to loom as our mask, 
can minimize it. Come up here to process, down here to noise reduction, over and down, and select multi-scale median transform, not linear transform. And the tool looks like this. Under algorithm, we're gonna keep that at the default. And then under layers, we want to change the amount of layers to eight. And as we just saw, several layers exist within an image, so we want to apply different amounts of noise reduction and smoothing to different layers to account for those differences uh, to maximize noise reduction without losing detail. So on layer number one, we're going to apply noise reduction, and for the threshold, I'm going to keep it at 10. And then for layer number two, I'm going to make the noise reduction active. I'm going to keep the threshold at 10, or move it to 10. Um, and then for layer number three, I'm going to make that active and I'm going to keep the threshold, or I'm going to move the threshold to seven. For layer number four, I want to keep, put the threshold to five and same with layer number five, I want to keep the threshold or move the threshold to five. And layer number six, I'm going to bump down the noise reduction to 2.5. Noise reduction on layer number seven is now active, and I'm going to bump the threshold down to two, or I guess increase it to two. And then for layer number eight, I'm going to put the threshold to two. So as you can see, I have different amounts of noise reduction being added into this image here. And with the um, mask applied, it's going to protect the edge, uh, the areas that we want and apply the noise reduction where it needs to be. So then for target, we're going to uh, select the luminance and let's create some previews really quick. So come up here and I will select this area and let's apply that. Okay, I'm gonna open this up just a little bit more so it's easier. So this did a really great job. Um, it's very, very subtle, and it's exactly what you want. So I'm good with those settings. Um, again, trial and error for your data set. What works for me may not work for you, but hopefully this just gives you an idea of where to start. Go back here to luminance, and now let's apply these settings to the luminance image overall. Okay, pretty quick, pretty painless. Bring that over here. And let's delete the preview. Let's remove the mask. And we can go ahead and delete our masks because those masks aren't gonna work for what we need to do next. Next, we're going to be applying deconvolution to our luminance image, and this is going to be a way for us to correct the light in our image for atmospheric distortion and to unblur the image essentially. And that's because uh, a star, which theoretically should be a point source of light, that light ends up looking a lot more like a small dish of light uh, by the time it goes through the Earth's atmosphere and through telescope optics. So as it reaches our camera sensor, the light actually convolves or spreads out. So our image looks blurrier than it really should look. And so by using deconvolving techniques, we are trying to mathematically reconstruct that original signal again. And so we end up having sharper looking images because the starlight and the high contrast structural elements show up more prominently in our images than they did before. So again, it's not necessarily a sharpening technique by itself, it's more a deep learning method that ends up with a sharper end result. So as far as I'm aware, there are two ways to approach deconvolution with NPIX Insight. Uh, the first is what I would call the traditional way uh, you could call it, which would be using the actual deconvolution process itself within PixInsight and also using uh, or creating a point spread function model that the process can then use. Or we can use RC Astro's Blur Exterminator tool. This tool is a third party tool that has a one time license cost to it, but it works amazingly. Uh, if you do want to check it out and try it out for free, you can do so with a free 30 day trial. 
I'm sure you're gonna fall in love with it just like I did, but for the purpose of this video, I'm going to be using the good old traditional way so I can kind of show you how deconvolu deconvolution works. So let's go ahead and open up deconvolution, come up here to process, deconvolution, deconvolution, and the tool looks like this. So under external PSF, that's where you would want to navigate to actually, and under view identifier, that's where we're going to place that PSF model or point spread function model uh, that we're going to generate from this luminance image here. So let's minimize deconvolution for now and go do that for now, or go do that now. Come up here to script, render PSF image, and this is the script PSF image creator. I'm not going to go into extensive detail about it, but if you want to learn more about it, we could do that later on in another tutorial. Uh, let me know down in the comments. So for the PSF functional selection, I'm gonna keep it at the default for MoFat. This works really well for uh, galaxies I have found. For numeric limits, I'm gonna keep the sensitivity at one. And then for amplitude maximum, I'm gonna keep it at 0.8. For amplitude minimum, I'm going to keep it at 0 0.04, and for maximum n, or maximum number of stars that are going into the evaluation process or into the model, I'm going to keep it at 50. Um, let's press evaluate and see what it comes back with. All right, we are back and we have our model here. I'm going to press create, and here is the image. Press OK to close out. Look at this little doodler. <laughs> it's very small. All right, so we have this dude. Let's go ahead and open up Decomvolution again. And under external PSF view identifier, this is where we want to use that PSF model. So select view in the drop down menu, PSF, press OK. For algorithm, use the default regularized Richardson Lucy. This tends to work really well for just about any type of image. For iterations, I'm going to do 50, but if you start to experience issues, uh, keep that at 10. For target, I'm going to use luminance. And for de-ringing, make sure that's enabled with this check mark. I'll get back to global dark and global bright here in a moment. You want to enable local de-ringing. And for local support, we're going to create a local support mask. You could create a local support mask with a star mask, or in my case, I'm going to be duplicating this luminance image here and apply a permanent stretch to it. Let's go here and duplicate. And then we need to apply that permanent stretch. So up here at script, utilities over to delinear. And let me just change the name for the purpose of not confusing other human beings. Uh, bloom local support and now I will move it out of the way so it's no longer obstructing our view this is where um, we would add it uh, here so loom local support the local amount or the amount of support from that mass I'm going to use 0.6 maybe try somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7 under wavelet regularization I thought I was going to totally butcher that as well because I usually can't say those letters all together for some reason, um, at least coherently sounding. For noise model, I'm going to keep it at the default. For wavelet layers, I'm going to increase this to four. Again, kind of similar to the wavelet demonstration that I showed you earlier. These images have several uh, layers of wavelets, so we're going to be working on um, different layers. So for layer number one, we want a noise threshold of five as a starting place. For layer number two, I'm going to use uh, a value of three. For layer number three, I'm going to use a value of two. And for layer number four, I'm going to keep it at one. Uh, for noise reduction, I will keep everything here the same, but I'm going to bump up some noise reduction on layer number two, just to 0.8. These are the values that I'm going to start out with. Again, what works well for my data set may not work very well for yours. Um, but again, experimentation is the key. So let's come back up here to de-ringing, and for global dark, a good way to find a nice starting value is to mouse over the image itself, and you should see a K value at the bottom of your screen in the middle. For me, it is 0.003. I like to double that value and move up, uh, move the value up uh, a tenth's place, so I'm going to do 0.0060. 
And for global bright, I actually like to just use the K value itself. So let's create some previews. I will create this preview here. Preview number one is going to be the before, so I'm not going to apply anything to that so we can go back and forth. And then preview number two is going to be the after, so I will apply these settings to preview number two so we can kind of see the difference. Let me just expand this a bit more. And that's a good place. Okay. Move over. All right. Apply that. Okay. So I am pretty happy with these settings. We don't have ringing or black circles around the stars, which is really good. And these elements right here are a lot more prominent, which is exactly what we wanted. So here's the before, and then, or sorry, here's the after, not the before. I just totally went over that. And here's the before, the actual before not the kidding before. So here's the before. Things are a lot blurrier. And then here's the after. Some might say this is a little bit too intense, but I think these settings are pretty good. Um, again, we're only using the luminance data for contrast and sharpness, so this is pretty good. So I'm happy with that. Okay, let's apply these settings to the luminance image overall. So we, we are back and it looks good. So let's close out of the previews because we don't need them anymore. And we also don't need this PSF, so you can close out of that. Same with this Loom local support, you can delete that. I will do this. Alright, let's minimize luminance and open up RGB. So we're going to be applying some high frequency noise reduction first, like we did with luminance, and then we are going to apply some medium and low frequency noise reduction with multi-scale medium transform. So let's go ahead and make sure that all of our values in this image are uh, 1, just in case you haven't done that already. Now let's extract a luminance file from this, so extract uh, L and give it a quick auto stretch, looks good. So we need to make this our local support image like we did for uh, our luminance data. So let's give this a stretch, so go, come up here to script, utilities, delinear, and now that has been permanently stretched, let's go ahead and rename this to RGB loom mask. And let's duplicate this for our TGB mask. Okay, we can minimize this for now, just so it's out of the way. And let's open up Curves Transformation. So you can just apply the settings that we used before. And then we are going to move that midpoint. So press reset, track our changes. And let's bring the midpoint to the 50% mark. That's good, not gonna be too much of a pedant there. Okay, click reset. I'm going to duplicate this image for our multi-scale median transform mask. It's okay, I will minimize that for now. Minimize that, bring this over, and we'll open it up here in a sec once we're done with TGV denoise. Again, we want to make sure that the TGV denoise and the MMT mask are inverted, but we have not yet applied the 75% um, midpoint to our MMT, so we'll come back to that. So Command I for inverting or Control I. Now let's apply it to RGB, and then we can minimize this so it's out of the way. Let's do disable show mask and open up TGV denoise. We are going to be working under chrominance, and for our local support, we want our RGB loom mask. Press OK. 
So you will have lightness and chrominance uh, applied or check marked so that they are both active. And I'm going to start with negative seven just because I know that works well. Maybe start at negative five and um, go down from there. Let's create some previews. All right, and let's apply this. Okay, so that did a pretty good job. I'm happy with that. So let's apply the settings to the actual RGB image, but I'm gonna increase the iterations to 500 under chrominance and apply that. We are finished with that. We can minimize TGV denoise. Let's close out of those previews and remove the mask. Now let's go ahead and open up the MMT mask again and we need to move that midpoint to 75%. So make sure that the track changes is on and the MMT is selected and bring the midpoint over here to 75%. Okay, press apply, minimize that. And again, you wanna invert it, Command I on a Mac, uh, Control I on a PC, and add the mask to RGB. Minimize that, open up multi-scale median transform. I'm gonna keep the settings all the same except I'm going to change the target to chrominance and let's create some previews. Try this one. All right, I'm happy with that. So I'm going to apply these settings to the RGB image like this. Awesome, okay, let's close out of those previews. We don't need them anymore. We minimize multi-scale medium transform. We can remove this mask. Now for um, the next thing that we need to do, we need to remove some of this uh, green cast on the image. So come up here to process, and then all processes, and we're going to use SCNR. All right, so I'm going to start at the amount of 0.5 uh, for this image, uh, it tends to work well. So you can either start there or start at one or start less. But if you do have a green cast like I do, which is tends to be pretty common, go ahead and use SCNR. So that takes care of all the linear noise reduction for our RGB image. If you do have HA data, go ahead and apply the same noise reduction steps that we applied for the luminance image. Um, and if you don't have HA data, then don't worry about it. But after you do that, um, we are now in a spot where we can go to the next step, which is stretching the data. And we will stretch the data in part two. So I will see you all over there. And thanks so much for watching step one.